Hey guys, after the last few major TV projects I've done, I'm feeling a little bit burned out, to put it mildly, and I think I need a bit of a palate cleanser. That would be uh, a couple Admirals, especially the last one, turned out to be a real tough dog, and uh, a couple Predictas that were, I thought, beyond hope, but got them all working in the end. But they were all a lot of work. I'm trying to find a little project now that will be fun, not so much work. So, in the midst of working on those, I picked up this guy. Admiral 19A11, classic late 40s Bakelite 7-inch electrostatic TV. Known for being one of the best of the 7-inchers because it's got a real power transformer. Unlike, say, the Motorola's you see me work on that have a a ballast and a complex uh, power supply scheme everything driven by cost minimize cost these are pretty robust this tuner may look familiar because it's pretty much exactly the same tuner that was in the Admiral 20 B1 I just worked on it's a big old clunker tur turret tuner it's got a real power transformer it's a really solid bulletproof straightforward design However, I've never gotten one to work. I tried a few years ago, and it kind of drove me nuts when I gave up on it. I think it's because it had a short in the power transformer. It kind of buzzed. It got hot. The set didn't work right. It got frustrated. Just shelved it. Since then, I've accumulated a few more. Watch part one. I talk more about it. So, what it comes down to is, this is the chassis that came with this cabinet. Let me get the cabinet out of the way. It has issues. They all have issues. Every chassis I've got from this model has got issues to one extent or another. This one, this isn't the original picture tube shield and assembly. This is what it should look like. It should have this kind of shield with the spring clamp. This looks like one from a Motorola. And that hose clamp is definitely modern. It's also missing a major transformer here. Probably got busted off. A little bit of a showstopper. We got some corrosion at the end of the world, but it's there. Underneath, it's pretty much all original, which is cool. Then this one I picked up a while ago. Um, cabinet's kind of busted up, but chassis in better condition. Uh, channel clunker looks like I got filed down. There's, somebody left me a comment. Yes, I know this can be replaced easily. I've got replacements. I got plenty of spare tuners. It's a standard, literally the name of the company that made this a standard tuner. That's not really an issue. However, it's got some other issues like somebody, for some reason, chewed up the output transformer. It should be going to the socket. These wires should be going straight down over to this. And it's been worked on underneath. So, <laughs> these are the best two of the ones I've got that I thought I would muddle around with. What a choice. Huh. So, what I'm driving at is I think I'll try maybe working on both of them. Or at least start out with considering both. So, uh, I would definitely need to scavenge a quail before I can even think about working on this one. I do have a parts chassis. I can get one out of that. Let's take a look at this guy for a moment. Some of these caps have been replaced. However, I noticed this one's bulging and there was some crud coming out here. I picked off a little bit. That cap is very likely bad. As are probably all of these. So what I was thinking about doing was trying to power these up as is to see where things stand. I know that's a real common thing people like to do is, hey, let's try doing a control power up, dim bulb tester, see where, see if we can get something out of the set, see if the major components are good or not. I get it. That's a that's certainly an option, generally speaking. Um, often in the past, I haven't done that because I have the luxury that for most of the sets I work on, I've got spare parts or have sources where I could probably get them. So I just dive into working on it because, like, say this part's bad. 
other people, if this is the only chassis they got and they don't have any hope of getting this, they might want to test this first, or this, or the pitcher tube. I've got spares of everything. So that's why I generally just dive in and just start clipping out parts and replacing them. But, I also know that's not the most interesting experience for the viewer, and you really don't learn a whole lot about that except how to solder and clip out parts. However, when I see caps that are visibly losing their innards, kind of know that's on the power supply. If I turn it on, it's probably not going to do a whole lot. Um, let's take a look at this guy too, maybe a similar situation. Um, but this one, like I said, it's clearly been worked on. These are replacement caps. I think that probably is because that clip looks like it's been replaced. Which means there's a chance that this might have some life left. The fact that that one is oozing, probably not. But, alright, I just get to it. Here's what I'm proposing to do. Clearly, these aren't going to work if the power supplies are shot. So I was thinking what I would do is clip out the obviously bad filter caps in the power supply, tack in replacements, then try to power them up. Trying to make this fun and interesting for you guys as well as myself. And try to do a little troubleshooting instead of just blowing through and recapping the whole thing, which I already know how to do. And, you know, we're not going to learn anything from doing that. That's why I also generally tend to not test any of the tubes until after I power it up. Then if something doesn't work right, then I'll try to then I'll go through and start checking the tubes. Uh, I did check this pitcher tube and it tested okay, but I know it's got issues. The base is loose and some of the pins are loose. So I gotta be very ginger with that. I don't think I've tested anything in this one yet. Um, again, I think it makes it more interesting. We'll just discover problems as we go. So that's what I'm thinking. I know there are many filter caps on this thing to begin with. Uh, now let's take a, a quick look under this guy. Now the other really cool thing about working on two identical chassis at the same time is you've got a reference point. So already we can see, this is how I knew that these were not original. Was, hey, it should just be open space down here. So they tacked in some, well, for the time, these were probably small caps, but by today's standards, these are kind of huge for, for what they are. They tacked them in here. They probably left the original cap in place. Maybe it dried out and it's open. So we'll have to check that out. There's where the original filter cap is coming through down below. And here's what, this is very likely the original three-section electrolytic. And that's a replacement. That is also a replacement, but I think everything else in this one is original. And these look to all be the original. These are the high voltage capacitors. These are 6,000 volt caps. Oil impregnated, that's why they look, well, they look oily. They soak the paper in these in oil to increase the electrical resistance. Usually bad, but let's give them a, sh give them a shot anyways. Something else just jumped out at me is this odd looking thing up here. This is a high voltage dividing network. It's wired a little bit different in this one versus this one. That I wasn't expecting because I'm pretty sure these are identical production runs. Let's check out the serial numbers. 14191 21935 19A1S, this doesn't say anything, so maybe these are not quite, maybe, well, going by the serial number, this would be, or no, sorry, so what am I saying, this would be a somewhat later revision. Not a huge difference, though, 14,000 to 21,000, it's about 7,000 made in between. Let's see, somebody wrote S59-2, maybe it was serviced in 1959. That seems unlikely. That somebody in 59 would be mucking around with a TV this old. Would have been 10 years old at that point. I mean, maybe it's possible. Um, otherwise... Yeah, they look pretty similar. The thing that jumps out at me is the obvious difference in the appearance of the components. They must have had different vendors 
is almost every cap looks different. So we got the small one there, big one, An orange cap, Oops. yeah, tan looking cap, and so on. Largish one there, <laughs> smaller one over there. Keep losing my pointer, and so on and so on. Even the appearance of, say, this big power resistor. Well, it's flipped around in this guy. It looks slightly different. But, I believe the wiring should be identical between the two, and that's the important thing. I clipped out one of those yellow caps, and yep, yeah, 30 microfarad. It's supposed to be good for up to 450 volts. Not that it really needs to be, because this set doesn't quite run on that much voltage. 350 would be good enough, but anyways, let's see if it's any good. Wow, <laughs> we got solid leakage at 100 volts. So if you were going to form this up, one way to do it is to use a capacitor tester like this and just leave it on 100. And, and wait, and wait, and wait, and wait. Maybe after 10, 15 minutes, the light would go out. Then you go up to 200. And wait, and wait, and wait, and wait, and so on. Or, we could put a new cap in. The fact that it's leaky at 100, and f this much for this long, means it's a pretty bad cap. I'm not saying it can't be reformed. It might take an hour. Uh, and even if we did, I'm not sure how long it would last. The electrolyte may be uh, on its last legs, if it has any life left at all. But that, that's the issue right there. It's leakage. Leakage means there's current going through the capacitor and there shouldn't be. It should charge up to the working voltage and then just stay there with no more current flowing through it. So it's acting like a resistor right now rather than a capacitor. So, we are going to replace it. I'm going to replace both of these yellow guys. Then we're going to try powering this up. And we've got those chewed up speaker leads. So, uh, well, I'll just clip in a test speaker. It'll be alright. Okay, both the yellow caps have been replaced. It turns out the other yellow cap was not the one on the other side of the filter choke. This guy was. This comes right off of the 5Y3 rectifier. It's the first filter cap in the power supply. The other one was actually originally a 20 microfarad and it's kind of by the video amplifier. So that second yellow cap was replacing this one. And there's that 4.7K resistor. So going back a bit, the original cap, this guy, is still in the circuit. So this one's been replaced, and that one, and uh, let's give this guy a try. I'm going to flip it around, hook up a test speaker, get out a suitable AC cord, and plug it into my PR57. We are ready for a power up. Here's what I've got set up. I've got my multimeter on this point. That is main B plus for the whole set. If we don't have anything there, nothing's going to happen. I've got a speaker hooked into those mangled leads. And I've got it plugged in. I have not turned on my isolation transformer yet. The set is turned off. Here we go. Uh, I got it set for 117 volts. And we are turning it on. And, well, no smoke. We got B plus, it's dropping as tubes warm up and are drawing current. We got static out of the speaker. B plus is at 161, that's a little low current draw. It's actually pretty low. It's like 0.8 amps. 
This stuff doesn't use a flyback, but it does have a high voltage oscillator coil thing. That's what's inside that box. That's probably what we're hearing. One of these is brightness. This guy. No. I'd be stunned if we actually got high voltage. So those leaky caps. Uh, probably killing that. But we got some cracklage. And if I can find something to change the channel with, maybe we can even receive something. This will do. There are numbers stamped on, that's what I'm peering at over here, is there are numbers stamped on to the uh, drum tuner. I'm going to get it on channel 6. So I think it's about here. Hey! Alright, we got sound. We don't want a copyright violation. Alright, so, that's something. It turns on, doesn't blow up, no smoke. We got some B+. I'm not sure what it's supposed to be, but 180 seems like it's sort of in the realm of where it should be, from what I recall. Um, and we know that... The tuner is doing something, and that the RFIF audio detector, audio amp, all that stuff is doing something. So, next let's look at the high voltage stuff. Um, so, I do have... So many of you guys, I'm sure, have seen this Fluke 27 meter. Well, um, if you get it off the off of the eBay as surplus, they often came with this. This is a 6,000 volt probe, which probably most of you have never had any use for. It's just high enough to use with sets like this. Every other TV I work with, all the ones that have flybacks, I'll use 10,000, 8,000 or more. I can't use this, but with these sets, I finally get to use it for something. So. Let's get this plugged in, turn the set back on, pull the ground clip on, and now we can start probing around and see if there's actually any high voltage action. I'm not sure where the main high voltage output is, but pretty much if I stick it into anything up here, there should be some high voltage going on. Well, two... 2,000 volts. Oh yeah, we got a little arcage going there. Two and a half thousand. It's low. But it's it should be enough to get something on the screen, I would have thought. If this is the highest potential point, it should be more like 5,000, but I'm not sure that it is. There's a lot of resistors in here. So far that's the highest I've found.
Okay, I think this is the output of the f this guy. Right here should be the highest potential. Yeah, it's about 2.4. All right, so that that's really low, but again, it should be enough. So I'm gonna dim the lighting and play around with the controls in the back of this. Maybe there is a raster and it's just so faint we can't see it. Oh, yeah, stick your fingers into a set with the lights turned off. What could happen? This is brightness, I do believe. Oh, it's nothing. Yeah, there's going to be like focus and centering and linearity and stuff. It's not really going to make or break a picture. Kind of weird squealing changes when I turn that control. It's probably a horizontal hold or something. Oh wow, that control's completely frozen. Hmm. So frozen control, that would be vertical centering. I'll have to work on that. This is definitely brightness. So, yep. Alright, I guess I should look at the CRT and make sure it's even glowing. I'm going to flip the set down for a bit. So with the shield in place, it's really hard to tell if the CRT is lit up. You can see the other tubes glowing well enough, but not so much the picture. Okay, yeah, I can, I can, I can just peer down in there, and it, it is illuminated. Check my line voltage, it's a little low, it's about 114, get to get up to 117. I don't think that's going to make a huge difference. Hmm, wiggle this base a little. So I'm going to guess, there are a number of voltages on here, um, just take a look at the schematic for a moment on the picture tube. So I think 9 is the main accelerator high voltage, but you got to have the right voltage on pin 5. I think it's the focus and uh, the cathode modulation needs to be correct, or otherwise it could be driven so much that it's uh, cut off. Let's turn to darkness for a moment. We seem to have lost our reception. This tuner's filthy, so I'd be surprised if it's making bad contact. I'm gonna wiggle some tubes a little too. Oh well, we'll get there. It's a great starting point though. Oh hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, do you see? Do you see? It's way off the top. What do you see? Well, yeah, the vertical control is the one that's frozen and it's way off, shoved off the top of the screen. Brightness is maxed out. But hey, there is 
there is something. All right, this is going to be a fun project, I think. I just want to get some sound back, though. Definitely got to replace this shaft of the tuner. Well, at least I got it recorded. We did have sound for a brief, brief time. All right, cool. Uh, we got to get this high voltage up and free up this control. Uh, these are kind of grungy looking, probably from uh, from static electricity attracting dirt and gunk over the years. So this does not turn. Notice these are insulated. There's high voltage on these controls, so they have plastic shafts. And uh, let's start out by replacing the main high voltage filter cap. That Could be that guy. So if that's leaky, it's going to drag down the high voltage. And I believe it is that one right there. In fact, I know it is because that hiding back there is a high voltage rectifier tube. There's a 1B3 rectifier inside this box. If that doesn't help, this would be the next suspect. This high voltage coil is driven by a 6V6. If any of these associated parts are bad, uh, it's not going to be getting enough oomph into this coil and kicking out enough high voltage. Or, of course, the tube could be bad, but yeah, usually they aren't. Slight change of plans. I was checking out the service that I found B plus is supposed to be around 255, and we're at, well, below that, I think like around 180, 190. Uh, last time I, I checked, and as I mentioned earlier, if you don't have good B plus, you know, like we got like two thirds of what it should be, that's going to be affecting everything. We might have low high voltage just because of that. So what I'm suspecting the problem is the other section of this filter cap that's still in circuit. So these multi-section caps, they're made of like a jelly roll with a common ground put into a can. It's really unlikely that you have one suction that's so bad that they replaced it with an external cap and that the other suctions are going to be just fine. So I'm sure this other 30 microfarad suction that they left in circuit has got issues. So, in other words, this has been replaced, but this is still the original. And if that's leaky, it's going to pull down B plus going to the set. Probably there's some other issues too that could be drawing it that could be dragging it down, but that seems very suspect to me. And also look at the condition of this cap. We've got something oozing out here and we've got some crud around this terminal up there. Alright, fine. Where can we stick it? Well there's a wire coming off of this, going over to this terminal strip. It's just got two lugs, B plus and ground. We can put the cap right there. But I want to get this one out of circuit. Crude way is just cut this off and wrap it in electrical tape. But that means I have no hope of ever restuffing this can if I choose to go that route. I don't know that I will, but if I cut that lug off, for sure I can't. Or I would have to find another similar looking can and restuff it and replace this one with it. So another option is to cut everything off of here and then we've got some length on these wires. I could cut them all off, strip the ends, and then leave this lug alone with the remnants of the wires and uh, attach everything else together and then wrap that in electrical tape. 
Uh, and actually, while I'm at that, I could also attach the new cap to that blob and then solder it down here, but then it would be a little loose. Uh, at least, I think over here would be a little bit more secure. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to cut these wires off and uh, this power resistor. So we've got three wires and this power resistor going to this lug. We're going to cut everything off, strip the ends, solder it all together, and then uh, insulate it off. There are no other unused lugs around here that I can use for this purpose, so that's what we're going to do. Here's those wires and the resistor blobbed together there. I'll insulate that in a moment. I left it uninsulated because I wanted you to see how red that insulation is on the cut ends. So all this really faded looking wire here, pinkish kind of looking, salmon colored, that was bright red originally. And these are probably bright yellow. On some of these wires, the insulation is not in the greatest condition. On some, like the one coming right off of the 5Y3 rectifier, the highest potential in the set, insulation is actually just falling off. Reminds me of working on a Filco radio from the late 30s with natural rubber wiring, which just disintegrates. Some of the wires are in fine shape, like the ones in this higher voltage circuit. Maybe they're a different material, very flexible, just fine. And some are kind of like lacquered cloth insulation. And the ones off the power transformer are in fine condition too. Just, just some of them down in this area, over this way. So that's something I want to be a little bit careful of, so I don't create any shorts. And right now I'm going to test that original cap that I just took out of circuit. Just curious to see what kind of condition it's in. And not too surprised to see that it's leaky. It's just 100 volts. And even leakier at 200. Maybe it could reform. Seems unlikely given the crusty condition of it and the fact that one section was already bypassed. But notice, eh, it's not leaky at 100 anymore. So it is actually forming up a bit. But, when I go to measure capacitance, nothing. So, even though it may be forming up and the leakage is going down, it's got, like, no capacitance. So, in other words, it's not working like a capacitor anymore. I mean, we get nothing. What should happen, if you haven't seen me use this before, is when you, this is a, a bridge circuit, when you rotate this and hit the capacitance, so this, this should be around 30 microfarad, you should get a really distinct uh, pi wedge on this eye tube. We've got absolutely nothing, so. All right, let's get a new cap in there and power this set up again and check the B plus and see if it's gone up. It should be around 255. Time for another power up. Ooh, we were 250 something, now it's dropping off as the set warms up. 200, 198. Got 117 feeding into the set. Uh, 206. Well, it's a little higher than it was before. Still just a really faint glow at the top of the CRT. Or actually, I've seen some glow at the bottom of the CRT too. 
Yeah, I think we do have full screen deflection. It's just so darn dim. Let me check the high voltage again and see what it is up to now. I'm going to check the high voltage now. Oh yeah, and I'd noticed my antenna lead had fallen off. So we actually got plenty of booming sound. Uh, let's see, high voltage is now... Two point six, two point six seven. Still way low. All right. Now I'll try replacing that one high voltage cap, the main filter one. Here's the ooey gooey point zero zero five microfarad six thousand volt cap I took out of the set. Now this tester only goes up to five hundred volts, but I thought for the heck of it. Let's see how it does. So, let's go all the way up to 500. Huh. And look at that. It's leaky at just 500 volts. And no doubt at 6,000 it's going to be way, way, way leakier. So, uh, that's no good. Now, earlier I had shown in, in part one a container of parts that I intend to to use for this set, which included these Vima high voltage caps, which, as you can see, are not exactly the same style as the originals, but these are cheap, less than a buck a piece at Mauser. But for now, I'm going to tack in, and I already did tack in one of these guys, an 8,000 volt ASC, really nice plastic film cap, just because of the lead length. But these are cheap, uh, not, not cheap. Uh, if you can even get the 8,000 variety, you're going to be more like 10 bucks a piece. And the 6,000 volt variety are about 5 bucks a piece. But uh, they are certainly easier to tack in, so we've got it right up there. Let's see what difference that makes now. So hopefully we're going to see a nice bright image on the CRT, right? Right. Here we go. Or not. Uh, yeah, I think it is a bit brighter. Let's see what the voltmeter has to say. That's a little better. It's uh, three and a quarter, 3.27. In other words, 3,280 volts or so. It's a little brighter. start to see something here and play around with the controls a little bit. This is a vertical hold probably. Uh, this is horizontal hold. And this is like horizontal position. Stiff and this is focus. Ah, uh, see. Yes, yeah, so the other issue with the reception, this this tuner is really dirty.
There is some reception though. It's kind of trying to sink to something. Ah, this this is vertical clearly. So let's see. Let's see. This is contrast. Where's that brightness? Or no, no, it's contrast on the front. All right, well next I am going to take a look at the components around the 6V6 that drives the high voltage coil. Now there are four other high voltage caps that are in similar looking condition, so those are probably all shot too. So even if I work on the 6V6, the high voltage might not get any better. Uh, there's really only one thing to check here. There's a 0 0.05 microfarad paper cap. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I checked that resistor. It looks kind of toasty, but it measures 117, so it's not too far off. I'll check these two resistors as well. And that's about all there is to this. Uh, that's a mica cap. It's inside of the high voltage box. This stuff has a dash line is inside of that box. The 1B3 could be weak, but eh, that's a little unlikely. And the power for this circuit comes right off of that guy. Right off of pin 8, bam, right into that. So even if this was a somewhat leaky and dragging things down, uh, it wouldn't affect this too much. So it's on either side of that choke. And of course the 6V6 could be... Uh, a shot too. The resistors on the 6V6 circuit checked out within spec. The 0 0.05 microfarad cap is leaky barely at 200 volts. At 100 volts it holds up pretty well. So I do think it'll make some difference but it's not uh, necessarily going to solve all our problems. I think what it may is replacing the remaining four high voltage caps. But let's see what this gets us. I also lubed up and cleaned up all the controls and I was able to free up the vertical positioning pot. It's very stiff still, but at least it rotates. Changed a whole heck of a lot. Three and a half thousand volts. Well, before I go replacing all of those high voltage caps, uh, let's check the 6V6. That's a simple enough thing to do. And I suppose we can take a peek inside of the high voltage box because I imagine some of you have never seen an RF high voltage coil set up before. The 6V6 tests just fine. It's got the early style font, so this may very well be the original tube that came with this set. And here's what's inside the high voltage box. High voltage rectifier, and then this is the high voltage transformer. There's three windings on this. A couple turns of this yellow wire that just provides the filament juice to the high voltage rectifier. Then uh, I believe these two stacks would be the secondary with a whole bunch of turns of fine wire. And then the bottom one, it's a little bit thicker gauge, that would be the primary. So what we're seeing in here, that'd be the primary, 5 ohm, secondary, 1000 ohms. And there are those couple loops that power the uh, rectifier filaments. And so, you're probably wondering, what the heck is this spring feedback? That's, one of the, that's what keeps the oscillator going. 
it actually feeds and picks up uh, capacitively, inductively, picks up a signal and feeds it back to the circuit. Uh, that's what this is. It's dashed line here. And you need to position that for maximum efficiency. And typically the, the correct position is exactly where this one is. It's the gap between the cathode and the uh, plate structure. Although actually I don't know if that's a cathode. I guess it's, it's not actually. That's, uh, the filament kind of goes up inside there so you can't really see it. It's that, that, that whole big bell thing that is the plate. And there's a big gap between that and the uh, filament. That's how it's able to handle pretty high voltages without uh, irking. Anyways, that all looks fine. Uh, here's one of those very difficult to replace mica caps. Let's hope that's good. I've got some experience with this type of set. Electrostatic set. And again, my gut tells me it's going to be replacing the other high voltage caps that's going to solve the problem. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and tack in uh, and replace those remaining four high voltage caps right now. Not so fast. Something struck me as odd when I was comparing the two chassis up in this area. And I just confirmed it. This circuit's been altered. This resistor clearly doesn't match the others. The way this circuit is supposed to be wired is there should be a 1 meg resistor going from this point to this lug and then a 1 meg resistor from this lug back to that. Instead we got a 1 meg, a 4.7 meg, and a 1 meg. This is a focus control. And this, these are uh, divider resistors. 2.2, four 2.2's in a row. So that matches. That would be one, two, three, four, and then there should be a one mag, focus pot, one mag, then the rest of the circuit. That's a pretty extensive modification to tack in um, about six more meg into this side of it and then remove that. So in other words, they drastically increase the resistance here. So what effect is that going to have? Well it's going to push this focus voltage lower than it would be normally and also the voltage that eventually gets down the 6SL7 for the vertical output is going to be a bit lower. However, increasing the resistance in this string is not going to drop or have any effect on the main high voltage coming out of the supply. But I do want to put it back to stock the way it's supposed to be. And while I'm at it, I'm going to test these resistors, which are all looking pretty crummy. I had a hard time even verifying that the colors were correct on them. I wired into new 1 meg resistors and took out that modification. Let's see what that gets us. I did not replace any of the other high voltage caps yet. Alright, so we got our sound. So dim, I gotta kill all the lighting. Looks like we do have better focus now. Yeah, focus control is doing something. Let's see if the hold control.
Well, there's actually kind of sort of an image there. I'm going to feed in a uh, stronger signal source. Let's see if we can actually see something. Okay, this time with a good strong signal from an over-the-air converter box going right to the antenna terminals. So if this is channel 6, I think I got my converter on channel 3, so 6, 5, 4, 3, yes. Hey, I can kind of see an image. <laughs> if I turn it off, boy is that faint. I think this is, one of these is height and one of these is hold. Not quite sure what's what. That's horizontal size. I think that's horizontal hold. Vertical centering. Let's get that up a bit. And the vertical is kind of folded over. It looks like it's an old Buster Keaton movie. I'm not sure exactly what channel I stumbled across. Ah, there we go. <laughs> we'll adjust some of the fine tuning it's through that horrible buzz. So now I'm curious, uh it's dragging down the high voltage so much. Maybe I shouldn't be so quick to discount the high voltage rectifier. I mean, it's rare for them to go out. It's not impossible. And they're kind of a pain to service. So, uh, it's very likely that the, the one that's in there is the original. Um, Certainly easier to try swapping that out than replacing all these caps, and that's the last thing I want to do because I know a motto: it's always the cap. The caps are always bad. Replace all the caps. Yes, they probably are all bad, and yes, I will end up replacing all of them. But that doesn't mean the set can't operate to some extent with the old caps in there, and that's what I'm kind of curious about: is with the least amount of replacing of parts. How well can we get this set working? So B plus is still a little low, which is going to result in low high voltage. The three sectional electrolyte down there has been replaced with three new caps. This cap looks newer. 
um, but I have not tested it. Um, and yes, if some of these paper caps are leaky, just kind of feeling around to see if any of them are warm. Because for a cap to be leaky enough to drag down B plus by say 50 volts, it would have to be getting pretty toasty and bubbling some wax. And um, nothing's warm. Even these power resistors really aren't warm, so. <laughs> There's another possibility too, which is the 5Y3 could be weak. Um, so let's try swapping that too. In fact, uh, I'll do that first because that's uh, super easy to do. After a bit of thinking, I decided, what the heck, let's replace the high voltage rectifier. Because it sure looks like it's the original. And here she is. It says 9-04. I'm thinking that's like fourth week in 1949. And the coil around this was rusty and really stuck on there. So was the plate cap. But here's the interesting thing. So, let's take another look at the circuit. So, high voltage rectifier. Uh, the heater and cathode are one and the same, and they take the high voltage off of uh, pin 2 here, and it goes over to a 10K resistor, and then to that filter cap. That's the one I replaced. I measured the resistance across that 10K resistor, and it was shorted. And I actually picked the high voltage off of pin 7, not pin 2. So I thought, well, maybe there's a solder blob between... Oh, I'm sorry, and they... The 10K resistor is between pin 7 and 8. Pin 8 is unused on this tube, so they were using pin 8 on the tube socket as a tie point for the 10K resistor. So between pin 7 and 8 I was reading no resistance. Or sorry, zero resistance. Uh, so I thought maybe, that's, maybe there was a solder blob or maybe a, a carbon track had burned through the socket. Well, then I pulled the tube out and lo and behold, the short went away. So then I got out my ohm meter and decided to check the tube. And it's measure zero resistance between pin 7 and 8. Unless there's some unused pins on that socket. Well, 8 is supposed to also, or I mean, they don't even put some pins on some of these positions. Um, but there we got almost a dead short. Like 0.4 ohms. Weird. It's kind of hard to see down inside the tube if something might have fallen in there. Was that intentional? Okay, I can kind of see now, uh, pin 7 is going up into the filament structure. These two pins in the middle, those are carrying the filament juice up to the filament up inside and down in there. It looks like pin 8 is going to this metal collar down here. And maybe that, and it looks like there's a uh, mica insulator, but it looks like it's maybe got some cracks in it. And I think one of those filament pins may be touching that collar. I don't think it's supposed to be. Well, here's another one. A newer one. Until that, because it's got the newer Admiral font on it. And this, this measures infinite between 7 and 8. And instead of a collar, this has a disc. And there's a big hole on one side of it where the filament lead comes through. And the other side is kind of a rectangular slot, and I think it might be welded to that filament pin. But it looks like pin 8 is not going to anything. Now, I don't know that it would really matter in operation. So that 10K resistor, I think, is just there to maybe protect the tube 
in case um, you get a dead short like on this cap or something else here. It's a current limiter. But I thought that was kind of odd. So I'm going to pop this in and position that spring so that it's in that gap. And well, let's give it a try. Putting in the new 1B3 rectifier really didn't change anything, so I just bit the bullet and replaced these four GUI high voltage caps and just tacked in some new plastic film ones. So, here we go again. Check it with my high voltage probe. Yep, 5,000 volts now. That did the trick. You can see the image is brighter now already before I had to turn all the lights off before we could see anything. For wondering why it always seems like the vertical circuit has more issues, that's because vertical circuits run on lower frequency, which means bigger capacitors, which means there are issues with the caps. They are, they are more pronounced. Boy, it's trying to work. Boy, I really can't get this thing to focus. I wonder if I, that's why they were mucking around. I mean, aside from all the sync issues and all the craziness, uh, I should be able to f get that to focus really sharply, and it won't. I'm also wondering if I'm fighting a dirty tuner here, so I'm going to change channels. We're even here just on an empty raster. Uh, you know, no reception. I wonder if this focus control might be shot. It's doing something, but not as much as it should. Hmm. Well, how's about next? I work on the vertical circuit so we can stop having seizures while we're trying to look at this thing. Um, and also the vert vertical is more complicated. So the horizontal, as I mentioned in the first installment and I, I linked to an article, it's a really amazing circuit. It's just that. It's one half of a dual triode tube uh, with some very, very clever engineering. 
So sync amplifier, bam, right into this. <laughs> it goes directly to the deflection plates on the CRT. Vertical, considerably more going on. We got a blocking oscillator and then a balanced vertical output, so three triodes rather than one triode. And uh, a transformer. And uh, there are also some high value resistors involved here. A couple 4.7 megs off the plate and two 10 megs. Uh, three, four, four 10 mega ohm resistors in uh, the output circuit. Why does that matter? Because large value resistors uh, can sometimes tend to drift off value a bit. And uh, 0.1 microfarad cap and 0.05. Those may are very likely leaky. And then here's the oscillator. So we've got a few issues going on potentially. It could be an issue with the sync amplifier. We're not getting a good strong sync pulse into the oscillator, or it could be the oscillator is so flaky it can't. It's it's way off frequency and it can't. It's not locking on to that. And I think. Let's see, is there any feedback in this? No. I've seen some where they take. Um, they pick off uh, part of the output so you don't feed it back to the oscillator, but this one now, the, the oscillator is self-contained in this circuit here. Well, these are the coupling caps from the oscillator to the balanced output, so probably that's not going to be making it all fl flaky as it is. I'm more inclined to tackle the uh, oscillator parts here, so I'm going to check these resistors and these 1, 2, 3, 4.01 microfarad caps. Well, another odd thing and another slight change of plans. These guys. These are the plate resistors on uh, the 6SL7 balanced output, these two guys. I can't measure any resistance on them. They're, they're measuring open. Just like the 4.7 meg uh, that I had taken out up here. But in both cases, if the resistor really was open, there'd be some noticeable problems, like we wouldn't have had any vertical deflection at all. I know my meter can check them because I, I checked the new 4.7 meg resistor, checked fine. I checked the other 10 meg resistors in, in the set and I, I could measure those, but these I can't. Now, carbon cap resistors can do kind of funny things when there's high voltage involved and perhaps when there's significant voltage across these, it can make its way through, but the low voltage from my ohm meter can't. Well, they've been replaced, and yeah, I know that looks crude, but that is how they did it originally. They just twisted the two ends together and had it sticking up and put a yellow, this yellow wire going to them. So <laughs> that's what I did too. Um, there was also a replacement cap down below on the sink circuit, 0.05 rated for 1600 volts. The value's right, it doesn't need to be anywhere near that much voltage, but just the fact that we got issues with sync and this was replaced made me suspicious, so I replaced that, and I replaced one other cap in the sync circuit. Uh, the, sync, uh, the cap coupling the sync amp and sync inverter. So let's give it a try with those changes. So I didn't do anything to the vertical oscillator yet. But uh, these, these suspicious components made me think, you know, I better uh, pull those out and let's see what effect that has.
Boy, the focus looks way worse now. Oh, there we go. Hey, now the focus circuit's working right. That's what I'm talking about. So that makes sense because if you follow that whole resistor divider through the chain from the horror, from the output of the high voltage rectifier goes through a whole bunch of resistors and eventually to those two 4.7s and down to the 6SL, 6SL7 and then to ground. And if something wasn't working right, the voltage wouldn't get divided right and the vo focus vo voltage wouldn't be correct. Alright, so we've got focus. That's a great step in the right direction. So. Well, with works. Oh, hey, 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 I saw a picture. Boy, I gotta clean these tuner pins. Hey, hey. Turn that down so I don't get a copyright violation. Hey, hey. Nice. Where's the width? There we go. Oh, jittery. Flaky, flaky tuner. <laughs> well, I know what I'm doing next. I am going to clean that tuner. Hey, how about that? Here's the chassis I propose scavenging bits and pieces that I need from because it's already been scavenged a bit. It's got uh, no high voltage coil, no CRT, no uh, volume power control, and the tuner is actually damaged a bit. It's missing at least one of these suctions, and the tab over here is kind of bent over. So that kind of stinks. Ah, <sighs> but maybe I will end up having to transfer the shaft and pop all of these out. But anyways, let's let's try taking this apart and see what we got to work with. So that inner shaft comes through all the way down to this end, and there's just this piece of spring steel hooked over an end here. And if we pop that out, that's almost freed up. And then we're going to deal with this guy here, which is a really stiff piece of spring steel and a screw and a roller. Can we get at that screw from the top? Yes, we can. Excellent. Otherwise, we can apply a bit of pressure and pop it out. But this makes things a little bit easier. Let's get this tube out of the way. Well, the one thing I don't know is in Canada, are the channels the same or were they the same? Pretty sure it was NTSC. Same as in the U.S. And from what I can see, we got five, six, seven on here. I don't know about it. it's the full two through thirteen, and if they use exactly the same frequencies, I'm sure I could do a little research and find out. So if if all those plugins were good and they were exactly the same, I'd be inclined to just transfer the drum over entirely. Uh, but also, in the interest of keeping things all original, notice on this one it's a different color. Dark brown versus sort of a tan, yellowy, mustard color. Alright, so it's loosened up, but still won't quite come out because we've got to deal with this front. It's been a little while since I did one of these, but I do know i got to take off this bit. Let's just keep going here. So this little assembly, I'll show you in a bit, is an interesting way 
of doing the fine tuning and I know it's caused some confusion. There was just a post a few days ago about it in all the forums as to somebody thought there was something missing or broken on their tuner, but no. It just looks that way. Uh, oh yes, I can tell this is Canadian alright because we've got some of these lovely screws which I've never actually encountered in person before. And I apologize, I just watched a little history documentary on YouTube about these. I can't remember what the heck they're called. Ain't they Robertson screws? Rather than Phillips? Or slotted? Yeah, there's more of them all over this chassis, I can see. So they are square. They're squares that are sort of stamped into the screw heads. Actually a really good design, a really good idea. And the reason why it didn't catch on worldwide is a very interesting story. I will try to remember to include a link. It's uh, the YouTube channel is called The History Guy. And he has a very interesting little 15 minute presentation on the topic. Luckily with my handy dandy little tool kit I've got here. has all sorts of bits. Including, yes, the one I need. So, there we go. And I know at least one of you out there was hoping I would restore this set, but given there's a whole bunch of stuff missing, I don't even have a cabinet for it, or CRT, or a high voltage coil. And if I scavenge stuff from an American set, or a U.S. set, to put in this Canadian set, then it really isn't all original anyways. I also, well, I don't have the Canadian service info. I imagine I could get it if I asked around. But anyways. There's another spring on this side. Same deal. Put a pressure, pop it out. And that will do her. So there it is. So fine tuning on this. Try zooming on that down there. So for the fine tuning they need to vary a very small capacitor a little bit to tweak local oscillator frequency just a little bit so it has a range of like one between one and two and a half picofarads throughout the rotation that is one side of the capacitor that leads into the local oscillator it's an insulated base it's just a metal button that's all that there is to it fine tuning shaft is this spiral piece of bakelite or not bakelite sorry phenolic it's an, it's an insul insulator it's dielectric as we rotate it, you get more or less material. And then this, sorry about this, this goes on the outside, like so. And this is attached to the chassis, it's grounded. You can see all the friction marks there from rubbing against this. So we've got a conductor, an insulator, a conductor that's grounded. This rotates, and that's your variable capacitor. That's all there is to it. Very simple. So this is what I'm after. The shaft with a non chewed up end on it. Looks like we got two through thirteen, so it's a real shame that yeah I could pop six out of the other one. Um, I could try to bend that back down, it's riveted on. I'd <laughs> do that relish the thought of drilling out all these rivets. Bending the piece back and then reattaching that, maybe with some small screws. Otherwise, maybe I could get slide somewhere there to get some pressure under it, lift it up a little bit and push it down, but I don't have that bit. Um, I could probably scavenge these. So these tuners are used in a lot of sets. There are slight variations between them. They're not all identical. Um, so I don't know if I took took this six section out of another one would it 
be compatible I'm not sure I also have a number of these tuners from console models with uh, well like the, that Admiral 20B1 I worked on recently I think they're gonna have shorter shafts though I don't know if they'll be 100% compatible speaking of I better make sure that this will work in that so I can see the other tuners got Patent applied for, it's a 94C8-1, I think. This is a 94C8-1 as well. All right. Put this aside, and let's make sure that the length is correct. It will fit. Oh. That is one heavy transformer. All right, so, can we perform... This transplant. Huh, this is a little bit longer, I think. Yeah, it is. Hmm. So, was this just not ground on that way? Was it cut off shorter? Not sure. Let's see how long. Pop one of these knobs off. Hmm, so if I put that in like so, yeah, this length does seem to line up with that, so I think it is correct. So what do we do? Do we transfer all of these onto this drum? Or sorry, what am I saying? I was thinking I could get the shaft out of this and transfer it to this, but no, because the shaft is welded to these. It's all one piece. Grr. Well, let me dig up another tuner. One out of a console set. Uh, I think I know where I've got one handy. But I have a feeling the shaft is going to be shorter. Yeah, that's what I thought. All the console versions I have have a much shorter shaft, so forget that. Huh, another unexpected development. Check out the retention spring on this tuner. That's not the same as the one I just took apart, nor is it the same as the nearly identical chassis I'd be using for a reference that has that larger retention spring. Now this is the older chassis. Both tuners have the same model number on them. But this must, well it is an older set. I mean, maybe just by months, I don't know. But uh, I don't, I've never seen that style before. So instead of being a big piece of metal that's hooked over, it's thinner metal and it's stuck through two holes. I also notice the color of the metal. Now, maybe it's just tarnished, I don't know, but those metal springs that hold the, the coil assemblies in place, it's kind of black on this one. Whereas this one's brass, and so is the one that I had scavenged out. Which I did work on a little bit, and I kind of bent that damaged one down a bit, so I think I could probably use this if I need to. And then the new old stock one out of the box is looks a bit like this. It's uh, if it is brass, it's been coated with something. Looks more like this earlier style. Well, anyways, so I'm gonna take some reference photos because I haven't quite seen this type of tuner before, and I'm gonna make sure I know how to put it back together right. Just realized the front is also different, including the fine tuning. Look how much smaller and th or look how much larger rather and thinner that phenolic disc is. So I definitely want to do whatever I can to preserve as much of this as possible, being that it's an early unusual. Uh, tuner and this project's turning out to be more interesting than I thought it would be given it's such a 
basic set. Uh, huh. It makes me wonder. I mean, it's, this is serial number 14,000 and something. It's, I don't know if they started at 1 for the very first set they made, but uh, I'm curious how early is this really in the production run of this set. I managed to get it open. I'm curious that looks like the four coil has been replaced. It's got the uh, different color, tan color. And I can also see while taking this apart this is a more primitive design. Mechanically anyways. So the newer tuner is, is, is more robust and probably works better. But I'll like to, I'd like to keep this one in there and try to get it going. Here's the fine-tuning disc. Uh, this is actually rusty, looks like. So this is definitely not brass like those others. This is uh, some sort of treated steel. Let's see. Yeah, so you can see this is this is a different design. The way they did the uh, springs on here, where there's a they stamped something into each one of these fingers, probably makes them stronger, stiffer. Yeah, they definitely feel stronger than these do. end is a little bit different. Uh, looks like it's not quite the same either. Like this groove is further down on the outside. And hmm, so that could be a problem. Otherwise, looks okay. It's a drag too, because this older, early one, it's more interesting mechanically. Like, look at this end. It's got some brass in the inner part, and uh, it's got more going on with these things that were put through and then stamped over. So, on the inside, pop one of these coils out. The interior must be a little bit different too. Oh yeah, wow. There's a whole big metal collar on the inside. It's very different on the interior. Which may affect their performance or the operation of this. Because having metal near these coils, I would imagine, has an effect on them. Transfer that shaft out though. I'm not exactly sure how they jammed it on. Here's what the real channel knob for one of these sets looks like. physically fit in here anyways and work. Now I'm wondering, are the coils compatible given that this has a different interior design? Does it matter having that big metal cylinder inside or not? Oh uh, boy. <laughs> of all the things to spend a bunch of time on with this set, this is not uh, Something I envisioned being such a big deal. But, that's why I do this. What's keep me interested is in different challenges, stuff I never had to deal with before. So, how can I test this without having to go to great lengths? 
oil. Let's see what the fine tuning shaft to work on this. There's so many little differences. So on the inside of this fine tuning shaft there's a little wire. I'm sure that's to keep brushed against the shaft to keep that piece grounded or something. Actually it doesn't even matter really because maybe it's to eliminate actually I'm not sure why that's there at all because the variable capacitor is on the chassis. But anyways this doesn't have it. So I can see the later design is not only more robust it's it's simpler to construct and to, to assemble. Let's see where will this go on. I'm gonna have to look at my reference foot because I don't quite remember. So this this has a little insulator insulating washer on it. But I don't know that this did. I don't really think it matters whether that insulating washer is there or not since the fine tuning shaft uh, rides on this groove anyways. But before I put this back together, how about we clean these contacts. So all these little buttons here go to coils inside, probably some capacitors too. Uh, where's that one I just popped out? Oh, here we go. You never saw one of these before, that's what's inside there. And there's a little trimmer at the end, and that's so you can set the local oscillator. Very simple arrangement, it's a threaded piece of brass, and this piece of uh, wire here actually runs in the threads on that screw, and as you rotate it, it moves in and out. Well, as you can see, these buttons get pretty corroded. Um, they're silver plated brass, I do believe. And they correspondingly go down to these, which are mounted on springs. And these are pretty worn and somewhat corroded. So rather than just spray deoxid into the tuner and flood it and rotate the drum around, which just makes a big mess and wastes a lot of contact cleaner, I'm going to spray a little bit onto a Q-tip. And rub that over the contacts. Now this middle one here, the silver plating has gone. It looks like it's worn down to the brass. Also some dried up uh, grease down in here. I'm thinking the bigger issue is the corroded buttons on the uh, drum rather than these. Oh, some of these are pretty dirty too. They're nowhere near as dirty as the uh, drum is. Well, that center one doesn't run on any of the buttons. It just runs against this, so I don't... I guess that's to provide ground to this. But so do the one that kind of... the. Uh, the, the uh, bearing points on the other two ends, so I don't know how critical that is. It's a little worn out. So that brings me to another topic that was talked about a bit online. I actually managed to cobble this thing back together. I did not put on the retention spring in the back because that's a pain. And I don't want to do it until I know for sure it's going to work right, nor did I reattach the mounting bracket in the front. But it's in there well enough that I can change channels. If I put a little too much pressure, it would probably pop out, but I'm not going to do that. And I lubed it up a bit for the fine-tuning. It seems to rotate all right. So, what the heck? Let's give her a try. on the right channel, let's see. Oh! 
Okay. There's something that actually looks pretty good. Let's see your vertical hold. Can't quite get it to lock. Well, it seems to work better than the other tuner drum, that's for sure. I think uh, it's time to get back to the vertical circuit. So I'm going to switch the channel on my converter box. I can do channels 3 or 4. I think it was on 4. Yep, there's 3. Alright, let's work on that sink in the vertical circuit because it's making me sick, seasick trying to watch that screen. But, okay, that tuner transplant seems to be a success. So this is the drum that came from that Canadian set. So it is missing that channel 6 segment. Um, I can try taking one out of, say, this... I wonder though, I just realized these all have F on them. That could very well have a significance. This is a different model tuner. Hmm. Wheel. Maybe uh, I best start with popping the channel 6 slugs out of uh, the drum that came with this set. It's a real shame. I would have liked to have used this drum with that unusual uh, construction. I mean, yeah, sure, I could cut the end of the shaft off. I could weld on a new piece of metal and I could grind down uh, you know, the right things. I mean, I'll certainly hang on to this. And uh, it could certainly be popped, swapped in if I was ever able to repair that, that shaft. It's weird, though. I didn't realize it. Well... Didn't realize it wasn't just that it's chewed up, it's actually a little bit shorter than it should be as well. Otherwise, I could grind that down until it's shiny metal and then glob on a bunch of like lead or something and kind of form it back up. But uh, it wouldn't be very strong. It might uh, deform over time. I don't know. Anyways, enough about that. Let's move on. I tacked in a couple new caps down in here. Those are the coupling to the balanced vertical output, the 0.05 and the 0.1. Because I noticed, in addition to the uh, vertical being unstable and not locking, it's also the linearity is horrible, which makes me suspect especially this coupling cap. I you may also notice that I've just been tacking these parts in, not... Uh, doing a very good job of securing them like this guy especially. There's a reason for that is that I anticipate I'm going to be replacing some of these other caps and they all go to that same lug so when I get around to these assuming I do I'll clean off that lug and secure everything more uh, more properly. But uh, let's see what this got us. Because the very next thing I'm going to go after Assuming we still have some troubles, is uh, or are, are these .01s down in here? This is a 6SL7. Uh, or no, sorry, sorry. This is a 6SL7 uh, balanced output. To that, I believe, is the vertical oscillator. So 
I also think this picture tube may be a bit shot. I'll show you why if we can get a stable image. Oh, that's right. I was cleaning the tuner and I changed the channel. Still not making the greatest contact. But we do a vertical sink, so yeah, that's something. It looks like the linearity is better, but the hold is still really lousy. So it's locked now, but it's actually not quite right, because I think it's, a, it's um, locking it like twice the frequency it should be, because there's kind of a double image. Great sound, though. So I'd mentioned about the CRT being weak. I'll try to demonstrate what I'm talking about. I'm going to take this a little bit so it's out of the light a little. And let's see, can we get this to stay a little bit more stable? All right, so as I play with the brightness, as I make it brighter and brighter, the image kind of inverts. i got to keep it dim and keep the contrast kind of low, otherwise the image starts to get funky. That's what happens when you got a weak... CRT. I'm not completely giving up hope. As you know, there's still other problems with this set. I think you'd have to watch this in a very, very dim room as things stand. Oh, we just lost everything. All right, well, I am going to go after some other caps in the vertical circuit now, the ones in the oscillator. So the linearity, things are looking, I know it's really hard to tell because the image is so jittery, but when I would occasionally get a stable image, things look pretty egg-shaped to me. That seems to have been solved, but now the height control, I've got maxed out, and we still don't have full height. And uh, the sink is uh, non-existent. But the horizontal sink is solid, which means the sink circuit is probably working this stuff. I really think the problem lies over here. So that's, that's where the hold and the size controls are. So that's all those uh, this 4.01 microfarad caps all done in there. That's all these. Kind of curious that one looks like a different type. That might not be it. It might be this one. Because I would expect all four to be identical. Or perhaps one of them is this one that's been replaced. Just notice that. See if that is a .01. Let's see, that's going from ground to 100k to a pin on that 6s and 7 that ground 100k 6s and 7 so that's coming off the sync amplifier going down so that that's the cap that's been replaced so perhaps that one is all right but let's go after these other uh, three 
I went through and replaced the last few caps in the vertical circuit and while doing so I identified what these transformers are for. The one that's missing on the other chassis right here, that is for the horizontal oscillator. That's that guy. And there's another coil not far away, that is the vertical oscillator coil. Hey, well that seems to have fixed our problem with the vertical. Let's tweak the focus a little bit. Oh yeah, wow, that's a really nice picture. So these sets uh, have a reputation for working quite well. So you can increase the width a little bit. Nice. Now one thing, uh, I notice the tuner is still pretty touchy. See why. I took the roller ball out. Little roller ball goes into this piece of spring steel, and that's what locks into these notches and does that clunk 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 effect. Well, this arm on the other end of it, there's a screw that holds it down. It's got a slot on it. You can move this arm in and out. When I put this thing back together. It turns out it's a little bit misaligned, so when I had that roller ball on there and I would turn the channel and it would clunk, these would not be making contact with the little um, switch contacts inside the tuner. So, i got to fix that. Unfortunately, you can't get at that screw while the picture tube's installed. So I, I have to unmount the picture tube, kind of rotate it out of the way, have it so the set's operating, <laughs> and loosen up the screw and adjust it so that uh, everything's making firm contact when the uh, channel is locked in. So that's going to be fun. Otherwise, I'm not quite sure what to do next. Um, it seems to be working pretty well, even though I still have a bunch of the old caps in here. Now, I do want to go through, as I said, and secure these better. Uh, as far as restuffing goes, I don't know. Uh, I don't think I will. Um, these plastic Sangmos, I got some tips on how they can be restuffed by drilling out the end of the plastic tube. But they're not much to look at. So, uh, I'm not so sure what the point would be. Uh, this is a nice looking Dumont one, but it's a Duracealed, and the ends of these are like cement. Very hard to get out, I'd have to drill these out. And, um, I've tried before, and it... Uh, it's easy to destroy the, uh, the tube. The only, in fact, the only caps that look good in here that might be interesting to restuff are the high voltage caps. I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to take a heat gun to this and clean off all this wax, and we'll see what it looks like underneath. I had raised the possibility of restuffing these caps in an earlier segment, and I got a comment saying that they'd never seen anybody actually show how to do it. I have. It's just been a few years since I've done it. I took a Motorola VT71, another 7-inch electrostatic set, and restuffed every cap in it. Because that had some really nice looking caps that had the Motorola logos on them and stuff. It's quite easy to do. So, heat gun, Wagner, high-low. I'm going to put it on low. And I, right now I'm just going to heat up the outside and take a paper towel and wipe all the wax off. And when I do, I think you'll see why somebody might consider doing this, because often they look quite nice underneath this old wax. Because this 
this is beeswax and it attracts a lot of uh, crud. So, check that out. <laughs> One of the reasons I like this Wagner heat gun is, well, once you get once you get the power cord out of the way, it actually sits up on its own pretty well, so that you can work with it. So that wax does a real nice job of preserving the old graphics. And you don't need to re-coat it if you're going to restuff it. Some guys do to get the original look back, but the reason they did it back then was to, you know, they thought it would keep moisture out and make the cap last longer. Um, but if you restuff it with a plastic film cap inside, which is what I would do, you really don't need the wax coating anymore. So that's the idea, get yourself a roll of paper towels and go over and heat the thing up. You don't need to get it all that warm. Beeswax melts at a pretty low temperature and you get a nice looking cap underneath. Alright, so how to get the insides out. The ends are a higher temperature wax, so let's get this up to high. Don't get it too hot or it'll start to scorch. Almost. Basically the insides will come out. Normally I'd be a bit more careful if I was really going to do this. I wanted to save it for posterity. So what's the point of restuffing caps? Oh, if this head has historical significance, maybe if you want to preserve the look. Or if you just get bored doing restorations and you want to try something a little different. And there we go. There's the old cap. If you want to really go crazy, you could save this wax plug on either end and try to reuse it. What I've done in the past is I got myself some brown hot glue and I would just seal the ends off. Cap got a bit dirty while I was working on this. I should have gotten another paper towel, a cleaner one, but I could go over this and clean it up a bit better. So we got ourselves a cardboard, hollow cardboard tube. Take your new cap, something like this, put it inside. Uh, and then I'd seal up the ends a little bit, with, usually with like a wad of paper towel or something, just for filler because the new cap is so much smaller diameter than the in that tube and then uh, fill it up with uh, some brown hot glue and that's it and reinstall it. So you get the nice admiral part number on there and uh, see the old value on it. That's really all there is to it for that type. Again for these whole nother matter. You're gonna have to use something like a Dremel tool or a drill or lathe or something to, to grind those ends out. Caps didn't last any longer, but that was the idea back then. Hey, if we seal them off, seal the ends with some cement or epoxy or put them in a plastic tube, these paper caps will last a lot longer. No, they didn't really. Paper still deteriorates, the caps still get leaky. So, just like that. Aside from the tuner, which took up most of the time I worked on this set, 
tacked in a few caps, replaced a few resistors, and bam, that TV is working pretty well. So, what next? Well, I'll get to what's next in a moment. First, I want to recap what I just did and why I did it uh, the way I did. Um, basically, well, one, to have a little fun, and two, to show you that with a little bit of common sense, some precautions, some visual inspection, yes, you can power up a vintage TV without doing a full recap. It's not going to be in the world. It's not going to a critical component isn't going to go up in smoke. Uh, if, but, like I said, use some precaution. Use a dim bulb tester. If you're lucky enough to have a PR57, it's a fantastic device. Uh, reforming caps, I don't think it's worth the effort. If you want to do it, try it. Be my guest. I think uh, if you want to quickly power up a set and you see a cap is oozing its guts, Clip it out, tack in uh, some electrolytics in place of it. Just to, don't put them in parallel. Cut the old cap out of the circuit. Find an unused terminal or, you know, bodge something together if you have to to temporarily tack a cap in there to just to power the set up. Uh, and also some quirks about electrostatic sets uh, came, to, came up. Um, yeah, these carbon composition resistors from years of having high voltage across them can start to act, behave very strangely. These both measured infinite resistance with my ohm meter. However, when they were in the set, the set kind of worked, which means there had to be current going through them. So I suspect there are some carbon tracks burned through these so they only conduct at higher voltages. Weird stuff. I highly recommend if you're working on an electrostatic TV, replace these resistors and replace them with these guys these caps they're sorry these resistors that are rated for several thousand volts um, so I'm gonna go through now off camera and do what I usually do and replace the rest of the caps I mean yeah I could throw this back in the cabinet throw it on eBay say it's a restore TV make a few bucks maybe but uh, I like to go through them methodically, replace the old parts, partly to make it more reliable, partly to see if it's going to improve things any, and partly because I actually kind of enjoy the process. I find it relaxing and enjoyable to do when everything goes well, anyways. <laughs> um, so I'm going to leave you off with that, and um, I'll pick up when I've gone through and finished replacing these paper caps, test all the tubes, all the usual stuff, and we'll see. We'll make a difference. There was a bit of hum in the audio. There was a, a bright horizontal line at the bottom of the screen. I think there might be a little bit of vertical fold over down there. Some of those issues may clear up. The high voltage may be a uh, little boost a little bit. And the picture will get a little bit brighter and sharper. That's pretty good the way it is, though. So we shall see. Uh, for now, I hope you enjoyed watching this uh, restoration of a 19A1 chassis. And don't forget, I got another one waiting in the wings, too.